Hello, friends. I'm Kathy Fay, Executive Director of the Boston Early Music Festival, or BEMF. And I'm so pleased to welcome you to this very special pre-concert talk as we look forward to the upcoming performance on our 2023-2024 concert season, featuring the extraordinary Jordi Saval and Hesperian 21 on Friday, February 5th at 8 p.m. in New England Conservatory's Jordan Hall. It is my honor to introduce our two guests, the incomparable Catalan Viola de Gambist Jordi Saval, founder and director of Hesperian 21, and Laura Jeppesen, longtime member of the Boston Early Music Festival Orchestra and member of the music performance faculty at Wellesley College, teaching Viola de Gamba. Jordi, as you know, for more than three decades, the Boston Early Music Festival has been so proud and so honored to present you both as a soloist and in collaboration with your various ensembles, Hesperian 21, La Capella Real de Catalunya, and Le Concert de Nation. As one of the most inspiring performers in the early music field, you are admired around the world for your integrity, for your immense musical curiosity, and for your creation of countless new musical and cultural projects, which have shined a light on repertoire that would otherwise have remained lost to us. We're looking so forward to seeing you in person on Friday, April 5th, together with members of Hesperian 21 for your exquisitely prepared program of the new music that took Europe by storm at the start of the Baroque period. Before I turn the microphone over to Jordi and Laura, for those wishing to attend our Friday, April 5th performance by Jordi Saval and Hesperian 21, tickets are still available and can be purchased online by visiting the BEMF website at BEMF.org or by calling the BEMF office at 617-661-1812. For those unable to attend our in-person performance on Friday, April 5th, virtual tickets are available as well. Our virtual presentation premieres on Saturday, April 20th at 8 p.m. and continues for a two week period from Saturday, April 20th through Saturday, May 4th. I should also mention for those interested in learning more about the program, you'll find fascinating program notes, artist profiles, and the full concert program on the BEMF website, again, BEMF.org. And now I will disappear from the screen, but before I go, thank you again, Jordi and Laura, and my thanks to all of you for watching this pre-concert talk. I look forward to seeing you at the concert on Friday, April 5th. Welcome back to Boston, Jordi. You have a huge fan base here, which has grown over so many years, and we're grateful that you keep Boston on your itinerary. We're all looking forward to hearing you next week. And I thank you for taking the time to talk with me today before the trip. Are you in Catalonia right now? I'm home, yes, I'm, but not for a long time. Tomorrow I, we do the last concert of the St. John Passion in Dortmund as a final uh, of the tour. And today we finish the recording of the St. John Passion by Bach. Oh, how wonderful. You must have played Esses Vollbracht many, many times yes. in your life. It's one of the most beautiful moments of uh, any it passion. It is yes. true. It is really incredible. Well, it's uh, wonderful that you can make the time for this pre-concert talk. Um, how do you fit in time to rehearse? You have a, you have a troop of musicians with you from a number of countries. Do they all come to Catalonia to rehearse with you? No, the the we the musicians that we come to to the this tour are Andrew Lawrence King, harp, Xavier Diaz, guitar and turbo, Philippe Pierlo, Viola da Gamba, Xavier Diaz, violone, and uh, uh, David Mayoral percussion. We we have to do we do in, in the year with this group many many concerts. Uh, every piece is already uh, played and rehearsal for many other occasions before this tour. That means we meet 
the day before, and we will rehearsal in the afternoon until from five until 10 o'clock, and then in the day in the concert. Wow, that is quick preparation. Well, the preparation, it's going back to 10 years. Yes. Because even if there are some new pieces, um, but the the way that we are playing together, it's so um, exp- ex- has so a long experience that we can really be very perfectly together with very short rehearsal. We know each one other, and we have quasi telepathic connections. <laughs> oh yes, this particular program seems to have one foot in the Renaissance and one foot in the Baroque. Yes. Um, what inspired you to explore this transitional time? Well, I think it's a very uh, a special, interesting time because um, it's uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the end of the Renaissance, which in the program, are, in fact, are very few pieces of the Renaissance. Um, the pieces by Vincenzo Ruffo, Antonio Valente, and uh, the rest of the pieces are more already in the Baroque evolution and the new lang- language which is created uh, around uh, Frescobaldi, Monteverdi, uh, Caccini, etc., etc. This new language which it's in, has two important fundamentals. One of the recitar cantando, una nuova manera de scrivere e cantare, and a, a new way to, to write the music, to compose and to sing, and also the emancipation, the total emancipation of the instrumental music from the vocal music. Uh, in, in the During the Renaissance, the instrumental pieces are mostly transcriptions of uh, canzoni, of uh, madrigals, and then also from improvisations on ostinato. Mm-hmm. And then from the beginning of the 17th century, this will be consolidated with great composers. They est- establish a new language. And this is what this program proposed with pieces like the Capricci in Musica Atrivoci from uh, Vincenzo Ruffo, the poetical music kept from the Captain Humes, uh, which was printed in 1607 with beautiful pieces for three viols. Then the Frescobaldi, the, the Canzoni da Sonare, uh, Falconiero, the, also Canzoni, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think our audience might be interested to know where the words um, come from. The Le Nuove Musiche, where does that title come from? This title comes from the Caccini, a book, uh, from songs, which is uh, around um, 1612, I think, so. the, the date exactly, don't know. but it's a, it's the first book to express uh, a new way, uh, express the, the quality which in Monteverdi, uh, also Madrigals, is presented as a, a new way to express the emotions, giving first the attention to the uh, the reci- the well to you you speak the words in first line and second line how you sing the words the recital cantando it means you have to first take all the music of the words and then put the music on this already existing music because any language especially italian it's it's musical and so then me. it's a no, it's a new way to write also they they write in this in a very different way as a, as a polyphonic music mm-hmm. and caccini who was a singer then called his noble new art le nuove musiche exactly um where did where did he get his ideas do you think where did these ideas come from well, I think these ideas come from a, a new uh, conception of the recuperation of the uh, ancient Greek tradition. Ah. If you see, the first uh, principal um, uh, important pieces 
are based on very old uh, mythological uh, uh, histories. La Diana, L'Orfeo, all these pieces. And in fact, uh, the first opera from Monteverdi is a, a modern a recreation of the ideal of music and theater making from the Greek civilization, you know? Mm -hmm. In fact, we, we create uh, a Monteverdi, Caccini, Frescovaldi, create a new world inspired in uh, the ancient uh, poetical and musical uh, connections. So it's all about expressing words through music. Expressing emotions which are included in, in, the, in the words, you know? Yes. The, the the revolution here is to make that the emotions are really one of the principal elements of the uh, interpretation. So this is all about the art of singing, yet there's no singer on the program. Or yeah. might we infer that the star of the program is La Signora Viola da Gamba. Yes, I think the Viola da Gamba is probably one of the instruments who can sing in the best way. This was of the Cantare la Viola, was the way that the artists in this period, they sing uh, accompanied by the Viola. And I think this is one of the elements uh, be before the violin arrives as a, as an important instrument, the viola da gamba was the king of of the instrumental music, uh, together with uh, the lute, the harpsichord. But as a melodic instrument, the viola da gamba was the most expressive for one reason: because the solo instrument for the viola da gamba family is the bass, and the bass you can play the music from all the ages of the human being because you have six strings and you have the all the ambitus from the human voices from the old man until the the young person mm -hmm. and this was the quality of the already in this time the principal quality of this instrument you can express and touch the emotions of every moment of the human life, you know? And this is, a, it's, it's a symbolic, but also a real thing. When you play a melody in the high, you you are symbolizing the, the purity of the young person, of the children. When you play in the low, you can express the, the, the dramatism of a much ex oldest person with a lot of experience, a lot of uh, drama, you know? But also, uh, this is compensated by another uh, aspect. The viola da gamba was the first instrument who uh, is used for improvisation. The first uh, printed books about improvisation are Silvestro Ganassi and uh, Diego Ortiz. And these books ex ex explain how to improvise, how to make a lamentation. And for this viola da gamba, develops a special art. In this program, we are using um, the pieces of, of uh, original pieces from with uh, ornamentations, with variations, but also we improvise on this. Oh, yes. And I noticed that one of your instruments dates from the same year as the publication of the Ortiz, 1553? Yes, exactly. And tell me about this instrument. Is this the earliest, in, the oldest instrument you've ever played? No, I have I have uh, some medieval instruments that are very old also. Um, I have some treble viol and, and uh, rebec. They are older of these. But um, the, the bass viol uh, from Peregrine Sonnet is one of the oldest bass viol. But yeah. because of this program, I play more than the 17th century. I will come for the concert with my Barak Norman. Uh, I have uh, in the concert, I play a bass Barak Norman from 1697 and also a treble Barak Norman, beautiful instrument, also from the same date. Wow. 
Where did you come by that very early um, 1553 instrument? How did you find it? Oh, this is a very good, I was teaching in the Scola Cantorum and I have made a master class with, for cellists. And one of the cellists goes to Rome to to uh, see his his uh, his luthier, his uh, and uh, the luthier has this instrument, and asked to the cello player, "Do you know somebody who is interested in my viola de gamba?" This luthier is a, is a, was a very old man, and uh, uh, the the cello student gives my address, and send me a, a photo very very. Um, unclear photo from the instrument and say, my God, what is this? I called them. I say, okay, this week I cannot come. I'm recording, but Sunday I will be in Rome. I take the plane. I arrive to his uh, uh, atelier and I play the instrument. It was incredible, beautiful song. Wow. My God. Was, and then we, oh, we, wow. we will be, the, the prize was correct. And yeah. uh, I take my instrument. It was very funny because I was, I have go to Roma without my bow. Oh. <laughs> and I, I ride to the hotel and I play pizzicato a little bit, but I put the instrument on a on a, a sofa, and I was in the in the bed looking the instrument like I you look a beautiful painting oh. or beautiful moon. I spent two hours only to to realize, oh my god. <laughs> Yes. But the back number they have as also is a very beautiful instrument, incredible. Mm. And the both instruments they have a special quality of sound, really something extraordinary. Well, with this program, you really seem to be saying that the viola da gamba is capable of imitating all of the sensuous qualities of the human voice with its agility, fluidity and just beauty of sound. Well. Uh, and that Nuove Musiche Tritis has a lot to teach players of the viola da gamba, which is yes. It also reminds me of the music of Marais in, its, in the way that the composer finds a new way to notate the expressive yes. nuances that he is hearing. Yes, exactly. So these, um, and I can imagine that Caccini's art entered the French court, especially um, the Italians when Marie de Medici married Henry IV, for example. Yes, yes. All yes. of that Italian music came yes. to the French court. So Absolutely. there's a direct line, isn't there, with the expressive playing of a stringed instrument. Absolutely, absolutely. The the the, the, the connections start very early, but the, the principal moment with this connection is very strong. It's a moment of the kingdom of the Louis XIII, Louis XIII. Louis XIII has played the viol. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and it, it's a very nice history. And uh, it's a, another viol player, very famous, André Mogard, who was also playing with the king. And one day, uh, André Morat makes a comment about saying, oh, the king is not so good. He was wrong in this place and make a critic. And then the king knows the history. Uh, and then he makes him to be th two years exiled in Rome. <laughs> and he writes, uh, imagine, <laughs> a, a punishment. Two years exile in Rome for, for him was a, a incredible exp experience, and he sent some information about the the way the Italian plays makes music. From it's it's a it's a it's a very nice small book with the letters of this of this Andrea Muga, and we know that the viol was very appreciated in this time, and this continued, and in fact the first to develop a new style on the viol was the the Andre Moga and then the the first viol players and then the starting figure is Santa Colomb. The Santa Colomb it's uh, who I think re, re, resume 
all the possibilities of the bio players they have developed in this time and gives a teaching of the great masters like uh, like Marie, uh, Marie, uh, etc. You know. Yes, and we the, have the... to thank for bringing Saint Colomb to the public eye. Yes. Matin du monde. Yes, yes. That's a very nice thing. But um, you're also representing uh, several dance forms in this program, and I find one of the most interesting um, stories in the history of music is the trajectory of the chacon from being a wild dance that was actually banned in public to morphing into a stately courtly dance. You've probably played chacon up over the years of many different styles. Can you elaborate on that? On the different kinds of chacon. The, the, yes. the chacon is is a a very typical uh, uh, dance, like the many other dances, like the folia, like the minuetto, like all the dances that we know from the end of the Renaissance. Uh, they have a, a very different type because there's a typical evolution that we have from these dances from the time they start to be popular and the time they will be used for for um, will be for chord music for composing music first these dances are used in the popular uh, village or in the in the in the simple people uh, in making music and then later the music was so exciting that the composers inspiring these and compose this music but if you, I give you an example, which is the minuet, the minuetto, uh, according the words of uh, Jean Jacques Rousseau in his dictionary, was um, a, a dance very popular and very lively dance coming from Italy and play in the in the sixteen eighty as a very lovely lively dance, and Jacques Jacques Rousseau says. But now, in 1750, it's the minuetto, the most slow of all the dances, you know? And this is why, because in the core, they have a big clothes, a very heavy clothes, a big perukes, a big, <laughs> and it was for these people impossible to dance like a, a simple people with a very light dressing. <laughs> And everything becomes slow and because Louis XIV has danced all the ballets himself, you know. And that is interesting because at the end of this part of the dictionary, Jean-Jacques Gousset says, c'est autre chose au théâtre. That means in the theater is different. And this means uh, in the theater, we are in the fiction. We don't have to make the rules of the court. And then when you have a minuetto in an opera, probably this minuetto can be fast. Mm -hmm. But if you have a minuetto in the ballet de cour, the minuetto has to be slow. And it's the same. You can do the same thing in the Chacona, in the Folia. The Folia in in in, 16, in the 1500 in Spain is Don Rodrigo Martinez ta yam pa pam pa pam pam ta da 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 da. And the Chacona Mara tam tam. It's yeah. it changed totally, but then it's used for making virtuosic improvisations, you know. And then it's then is also very live and very intensive. So Another thing to the Chacon because this is important. I remember now this Lope de Vega gives it a very nice description of the Chacon saying. Esta indiana amulatada que nos viene de las Indias. This Indian mulat who is coming from India, from the New World. That's a mix of Indian mulat. It's a mix of, of uh, black and white cultures and coming from the New World. Then probably the first chaconas are a mix of popular dance created from these influences. 
Isn't that interesting? From South America, then? Yes. It's, it's, uh, the music goes to South America with, um, with the sailors who they, they play music in all the, in all the travel and all the, uh, the ships are, are musicians and the, and the guitar and singing was the most popular way. And probably this was the first language that is the autochthon Indians understand. Mm -hmm. You can imagine it meeting the, the Spanish uh, conquistadores. <laughs> speaking no other language than Spanish. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I, I know this because it's something similar happens with um, Francisco Javier, the great Jesuit who arrives in Japan. They are arriving in the, in the, in the, in the city to the, all the, all the principal authorities are coming there. And he says, we don't understand anything and we will sing a psalm. A psalm, and then arrive and and write to singing a song, a beautiful song, and then everybody has understand, you know, because the music we we can understand. Yeah, and this is a very nice situation. Well, once again, this program is an example of your insatiable curiosity, and you have taught us so much over the years. And you, you've also given us so much just to enjoy. And we're really grateful that you continue to come to Boston. We hope that we will hear you many more years to come. You know, Jordi, I remember the first time I met you. I don't know if you remember, but we were in the living room of Vilant's house. Vilant yes, I remember. Yes. <laughs> that but... must have been... 50 years ago. Yes, 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 yes. I remember very well from this. Well, yeah. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you next week. And I thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And and thank you for inviting us. And um, it will be a great pleasure to come to share the beautiful pieces of this, of this uh, program with the audience of uh, the the Boston. And I'm glad you bring that up because to all of the audience members who are listening to this talk this morning, I would like to say thank you because it is you who keeps bringing Jordy back because of your support of BEMF. So thank you. Thank you, Alison.